I'm Joseph, and this week we're going to talk about creating a backyard garden that attracts birds. And not only do you want to attract them, but you also want to keep them. There are three main components to attracting birds, and that is food, water, and shelter. And you want to make sure that you're appealing to the type of birds that you find in your backyard on a daily basis. In designing our garden, I've been very mindful uh, to think about attracting birds. When you're designing a garden or uh, building some landscaping for the backyard of your house, be mindful that birds need retreats and they need lots of bushes and trees that they can congregate in and feel safe in your yard. Having very small, low-lying bushes with no height and no volume to them is not really conducive to attracting birds to your backyard. So you can see around us, we've got nice, thick, tall hedges that the birds can jump around in and feel safe and get retreat in. We've got uh, lots of low level brush coverage that they can hop around and pick weeds and seeds off of the ground. We've got taller trees for them to be able to roost in. We've got even uh, taller vines and much taller trees that they can be in. Birds require lots of different levels of foliage that they can roost in and feel very safe within away from predators. The other really important thing to consider um, is water sources for them. Birds really will be attracted to wherever you put bird baths in your uh, yard. Be mindful that bird baths should not be in the blazing sun. A, it will grow algae and B, uh, the birds do not like to bathe uh, right out in the openness where they can become prey for hawks or eagles or anything like that. We have seen since we've moved into the house that we've attracted a lot more birds, especially morning doves. And we've also attracted a lot of mockingbirds, which really sing quite beautifully. So you can see as you look through our garden, there's lots of places for birds to nest, to roost, to lay eggs and feel safe. We've put in quite a few different types of birdhouses um, to attract different types of birds. And I've researched what birds need, what size holes, and how big the birdhouses need to be. And as you'll see in the video, we're adding some morning dove nesting boxes, but I'm also in the process of building a dove coat for our yard. Here in Florida, we attract primarily cardinals, blue jays, mockingbirds, and morning doves. So it's important to create a food mixture that will attract those types of birds because they don't always eat everything that's found in a commercial bird seed mix. So I like to create my own food for these birds that they can eat throughout the day. And I usually make them in a suet type of a form. It's very easy to make and it's very economical. I make them in uh, disposable drip trays for outdoor or indoor plants. I like to use a very common household item, a clothes hanger, right out of your closet, which creates a nice hook to hang them on. They're very easy to make, and they're very easy to store in a refrigerator until you want to use them. So some of the food items that the birds in our area like to eat are dried mealworms, shelled black sunflower seeds, ground corn, and I also like to add uh, some dried fruits. And here we have some just plain old raisins that I've had in the cabinet for a while. So rather than throwing them away if they get stale or a little too dry, I'll always mix those into the bird mixture. So a few of this, the supplies that I have lined up in order to make this are uh, the plastic drip trays. These, this is a six inch size. I've just got some rough cut, small little wooden dowels that uh, I've cut to put into the suet once it's solidifying, and just wire clothes hangers that I have crimped up into small circles that will be placed inside, and that's gonna solidify in uh, the suet, which is gonna help to hang it. And in order to make the suet, we've got just plain old vegetable shortening that I've rendered down and liquefied and once this gets put into there uh, and refrigerated, it's gonna solidify back up and you're gonna be able to hang this uh, in a tree or off of a, a bird feeder hook or something like that. So after you have um, just curled up the wire on your hanger, you wanna set it in your plastic pan and you wanna bend the top up so that the hook is sticking out. 
very carefully just fill the bottom of this with a layer of the vegetable shortening. Spread some of the mealworm around. Add in some of the sunflower seeds. can do a layer of corn. This is just regular cracked corn that you find in a grocery store. This is the kind that we use to make polenta with. Maybe some of the raisins in there. This is just like the, the store-bought suet that you find in a Lowe's or a Home Depot. It's just a homemade version that's tailored to the specific birds that are in your region. And another layer. Each. The birds are going to love these mealworms. So spring is a great time to start putting these together, late, late winter, early spring, that you can start setting out when the birds start migrating back, but the, the winter is still a little bit cold. This is going to give them a little bit of extra protein and food that they're going to need. Suet is typically made with a rendered beef fat. I don't like to use beef fat because most birds are not carnivores, so I think that sort of doesn't make sense to feed them rendered beef fat, so just vegetable shortening works great. And then I like to put in these little dowels, and these will solidify in there, but it gives the birds a resting place to actually perch in order to peck the ingredients out of the vegetable shortening. And when after it's solidified, this is what it looks like. That's the back and the front, and this can hang right in a tree or on a bird feeder hook near a window. Um, and you'll, you'll be amazed at how the birds will just fly up, rest on the perch, and start pecking at everything that's in there. So the other uh, element that you need in a backyard in order to attract and keep birds are birdhouses. And there's a variety of birdhouses that you can buy, and you want to buy birdhouses or make them that are specific to the types of birds in your area. We have uh, three or four different pairs of morning dove that nest in our backyard. Come late spring, they're gonna start mating and laying eggs, and they need a safe place in order to do that. So just out of some scrap wood, I've created a, a very shallow nesting box that's specific to morning doves, and I've made them in a couple different shapes that we're gonna hang around the yard in order to provide some shelter for them. Morning doves will nest without these boxes, but when you're creating a backyard and a garden and you want to have your birds uh, nest in your yard and come back and stay in your yard, providing them with housing really does help. Depending on the different types of birds that you're trying to attract will depend upon what kind of house you have, how big the entrance hole will be, how big the interior cavity will be. What it, bird houses are not one size fits all. So research what birds are in your area and find out about what size houses they prefer and at what height they prefer and where they prefer them to be hung. So morning doves are a type of bird that don't like to be disturbed when they're nesting. So they do like to feel like they're under an eave though. So one of the best places to hang their nesting boxes, it needs to be at least six feet up and this is the back side of our carport, which is the perfect area for hanging this because the birds have some cover from above them, but they're also in an area where rodents or snakes cannot get at their nest very easily. So another great place that we're gonna hang one of our dove houses is on the back side of my studio in the garden. There's a fence down below that the doves can perch on right outside of the box, but it's an unobstructed area where the birds can easily get in and out, but they can also see what's around them, which makes them feel very safe. 
So we're just going to attach this up underneath the eave here using a screw. And that's going to give them a really nice box that they can lay eggs in, raise their young in, and be safe in our yard. After you've made your suet feeders, it's time to hang them. And this is a great spot to hang one because it's right in our kitchen window. So when we're doing dishes, we can look out into this cherry tree and watch the birds actually uh, get up on the dowels and eat the food. When you are not feeding birds bird seed or uh, store-bought food, your landscape and your garden should have lots of food available for them in the way of seeds and berries and things. And one of the things that birds in Florida love um, are the small cherries that this tree produces. So we don't actually eat any of the cherries off of it, but it does feed our bluebirds throughout the summer. They love to jump on the tree, pick off the cherries, jump down to the ground, and we'll just sit in the window and watch them pecking at it. So be mindful that seed is not the only thing that birds eat. And so when you are buying plants for your garden, uh, be mindful of what types of seeds they produce, what types of fruit they produce, what birds will actually eat them. And I know it's not typical that a lot of people like to plant things for birds to eat, but um, I tend to provide, in addition to things that we eat, uh, items that the birds can actually eat and enjoy as well. So thank you for joining us today. And just remember, if you wanna attract birds to your area, the best time to start to do it is in the spring, uh, early spring, actually late winter, when the birds start to migrate north. They'll be looking for food and homes and uh, sources of water because after their long journey, they're gonna to wanna to rest, build a nest, have some eggs and uh, procreate. So, uh, <laughs> The best thing to do is to start planting some plants in different heights and in different types of foliage and different thicknesses and uh, give them a new home that they can call theirs year after year. Hey everybody, thanks for joining us. We're gonna wait for our guest to pop in on her video. If you have any questions, please uh, send them in the Q&A box that we can answer. And if you have a, a question that's specific to uh, Melissa, please notate that and I'll make sure that I um, read it to her for her to answer. And welcome to my special guest, Melissa Rivas, who is the director of the residential studio at Hollander Design. Um, Hollander Design is a, an Architectural Digest 100 landscape architect firm. I believe they do work um, everywhere from the Hamptons to Hong Kong, if I read that correctly. So you guys have a very broad approach and I think that um, you would be quite the expert to speak about um, landscape design and backyard gardens and how to attract birds in your area. Um, so before, um, Melissa has a little presentation to give and one of the things that I was reading is that um, the Garden Trends Report for 2021 came out with the statistics that since COVID hit, there are 16 million new gardeners uh, around the globe, which is pretty amazing. So, and the way they categorize that can be anything from one plant to uh, fully landscaping a backyard. Um, but it really has generated a new trend that I think is gonna end up lasting for quite some time. Um, and the trend that they predict <clears throat> is the return of the backyard garden without any lawn. So I think people are looking for um, gardens that are a little bit wild, uh, low maintenance, but can attract wildlife to them. And the National Wildlife Federation says that landscape architects are seeing um, families change their preferences in lawns, which is occurring, uh, encouraging Americans to design gardens um, to attract wildlife with thinking about food, water, and shelter. Um, and so Melissa, being a, a, a commercial landscape designer, a residential landscape designer, do you see a lot of this happening in your work? And, and what do you see the trends being? And how do you guys implement that for your customers 
um, attracting wildlife and, and birds specifically to the backyard. Yeah, well, I mean, you said it, yes, we're seeing a huge increase in people using their properties differently. So I think, and I think a lot of that is that we're just not traveling as much as we were. So we're paying more attention to what is in our own property. And then because we're spending more time there, we can use it differently and we can grow vegetable gardens and we can create spaces for our family to entertain outside since that is a much easier thing to do over this past year than what we would typically be doing and eating indoors. So we're certainly seeing a huge change in that, which is amazing for us because I think, you know, when we work in summer communities, the exterior spaces have always been important, but now in areas where, you know, it's, it's certainly colder more of the year, it's forcing people to think about new ways to use their landscapes. So yeah, it's been a really exciting time for a landscape architect. Yeah, I've had an interest in landscaping, actually, well, gardens since I was about 15. Um, I put in a small garden at my parents' house with a little pond. I think they thought I was crazy and, you know, they probably complained about the whole thing, but that's what grew my love of, and my dad was a home builder, so they dealt with a lot of landscape architects, um, but I really had a passion for creating gardens with wildflowers and uh, retreats and, and natural habitats for birds to attract them. So what are you seeing in some of your designs? Yeah, I would say similar things. I would say people are getting into it in different ways. They're either coming through more of the flower way or what you're talking about of creating you know, these beautiful spaces. And then we see people coming in through vegetable gardens because for the first time they're saying, well, you know, instead of going to the grocery store, which became much more difficult this year, you know, even if you just start small and you have herbs or tomatoes or something that you really love and enjoy yourself, there's something so amazing about picking your own vegetables. I mean, not only do they taste better, um, but you can plant a much larger variety of stuff because certain things just can't travel. Um, and so if you're picking them in your own backyard, it just expands the amount of things that can you can actually enjoy. Um, so I think we're seeing certainly a lot of that, um, especially in areas that used to be summer communities. I mean, now people can work from anywhere remotely. And right. so, you know, that allowed them to be in these summer communities more, more often. So yeah, that's great. It's been wonderful. It's been a wonderful change to be able to focus in some of these spaces last year. It's nice to see. So what about some of the projects that you've done? Um, yeah, I mean, do you want me to go through some of these images? Sure. I mean, oh, totally. Yeah. Today. Show us what you got. Yeah. So, um, first, I just want to say how wonderful your video was. And yeah, thank you. Andrew touched on this earlier, but it's such a nice change to be able to see somebody's garden when our own are all covered under two feet of snow here. So. <laughs> well, it's freezing in Florida. So, <laughs> I see um, your <laughs> yeah. Although I welcome the cold weather because usually in the summer I just cannot go outside and handle it. So um, I've been I've been busy getting it done. <laughs> but you're probably in full planning mode at this point for people for spring, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is the time of year to reach out to a professional. So if you're thinking about planning a garden for the spring, definitely don't wait until you know you're getting close to Memorial there when you're going to enjoy it because. It is a long process and we do have to plan it out and we have to source plant material and line up landscape contractors. So this is one of our busiest times of the year, um, which people always find so surprising. They think we must be busy all summer and then, you know, what are we doing all winter? But right. <laughs> the opposite is true where nobody wants you on their property all summer and all winter we're planning for that, you know, Memorial Day reveal. So. Mm -hmm. Um, but to touch on some of the things you talked about in your video, you know, one of the things that you mentioned was habitat layers. And so, you know, this is such a great image for that, where what we try to do is to mimic nature the best that we can. And so what nature does is, you know, it has large canopy trees, and then you have your shrubs and your understory trees, and then you kind of get that lower level of perennials and annuals. And what this image shows really well is that you know, not everybody has the property to plant large oaks and maples. And so we can recreate that taller, you know, shade tree canopy by putting vines on homes or creating structure in other ways. And so what this shows is that that vine is, is 
essentially providing the same thing. It's giving birds a place to roost. It's yeah. giving them a, you know, a taller vantage point from within the garden. And then we then plant those shrubs and the perennials below. So it gives them a place to escape to. Mm -hmm. And then that lower level, that echinacea that you're seeing the bottom corner, you know, I just want to point that out because that is such like a powerhouse plant for pollinators in general. So mm -hmm. you get so much benefit from it. First, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, there's so many native options regardless of where you are in the US. And then all through the summer, it's giving you bees and butterflies. And then in the fall when it sets seed, you know, then you'll see the birds using it. So, you know, don't deadhead your garden. Um, right, leave it up, leave it up leave throughout it up. winter and yeah. And it creates beautiful structures <clears throat> even in a winter garden. Um, I can oh. still keep them in mind even with all of the snow. So it's definitely worth worth leaving. Um, and then you touched on birdhouses a little bit. And this is such a, like you could do an entire show on birdhouses, you know, like there's just so much depending on what type of bird you're trying to attract and, you know, how they like to nest and the different regions they nest in. And so like, I won't say much about it, but I will say, you know, what we try to do is we're trying to create these beautiful garden spaces that both humans enjoy to being in and then also creates a safe haven for birds. So we like to use birdhouses in our gardens as a focal point, you know, something that's drawing your eye to a certain area of the garden. So it invites you to walk out into it, you know, and if it gets a bird, it's like, you know, even better, but for yeah. us, it creates a beautiful piece of sculpture. And this is kind of showing you the two different ways you would use it, you know, because depending on the bird, you know, if it's like a purple Martin, they like to be out in the open. So you would want to do something closer to the left, but I mean, a large majority of our smaller birds are going to prefer a little bit of a camouflage or to be in a protected area because again, we're trying to mimic nature, right? And most birds are going to be in trees. And so you want to kind of give it that, that same, same feeling. Um, yeah. And I also, we also touched upon uh, previously behind the scenes about um, whatever region that you're actually in, uh, think about the birds that you attract every season and read a, up a little bit about them and what their housing preferences are. So, you know, uh, for instance, we don't get a lot of uh, small finches and stuff down here. So I would not necessarily put birdhouses in my yard to try to, try to attract a finch when I don't get a lot of them. But um, when we, just this last spring, we had about three pairs of morning doves. And so in my mind, I thought, okay, let's attract morning doves because they're naturally here. So let's give them a home. And uh, I think I just noticed two more pairs in our yard. So uh, we hung the houses and um, they haven't started nesting yet, but they will probably in another month, um, hopefully pick up the, the nesting boxes that we put out. Um, but it's encouraging the birds that you find in naturally in your region uh, to attract those birds. You don't want to try to attract birds that you would not normally see. So the type of birdhouse is important to think about um, if you are putting up birdhouses. Who, who is it that you're attracting? Yeah, I mean, this is a part that takes <clears throat> some research and a little bit of homework so that you're not spinning your wheels or, you know, like you said, like I could plant things for flamingos all day long and I'm not going to get a flamingo. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but if, you know, if you're, you don't know where to start, or you're like, how do I even figure out what birds are in my region? There are a lot of great websites. So I don't know if you know eBird.org. I know it's really good for my area, but it's, you know, part of the Cornell Lab for Ornithology. Oh and mm -hmm. so it's a great citizen science kind of website where, you know, your neighbors, whoever's a bird or around you will go in and they can log in what bird they're actually seeing. So you can go in and say, oh, you know, there's this scarlet tanagers in my neighborhood, like, let's figure out what I can do to get it here. And you'll be so much more successful than if you went at it blind, so. Yeah. And this image that you're showing is actually a project that you did. Yeah, all of these images are home. Designed. It's absolutely beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so, and we do get a lot of requests for this type of stuff. And we get a lot of requests for water features too. Um, and so one thing to note on these water features is, you know, in relation to birdhouses, um, one thing that you want to keep in mind is that you don't want to put your birdhouse too close to your water feature because water features will 
attract all different types of birds. So you think, oh, I want to put everything that my bird needs, you know, right next to the birdhouse, but you could get a predator bird that's visiting your water feature and you're not realizing it. And it might cause your nesting birds to become uncomfortable. And so they'll then leave. Mm -hmm. um, and so you'll notice like if your birds aren't sticking around a long time, it's because you did something wrong, that location is wrong. And it might just be that these areas are attracting too many birds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one thing to also keep in mind is, you know, it's always a good idea to have the sound of water in your garden, especially if you're trying to get a migratory bird because they, birds have an amazing sense of hearing. So right. flying overhead and they can hear that sound of water, you're gonna have many more birds visiting um, than just the ones nesting on your own property. So. And also like you, you know, made the great comment about how you don't want things to be growing in your water feature for it to start harboring things. So mm -hmm. movement of water really, really helps with that. Yeah. Um, and then planting. So one of the things that I think we make a big mistake on is that we try to plant kind of one of everything. Um, mm -hmm. And so like landscape designers will tell you, you know, you want to plant everything in mass. Like not only does it look more beautiful, I mean, it looks like thought out and planned, um, but it's going to be favored by pollinators and birds too. You know, pollinators like to feed on mass of like the same type of flower. So the more you have, especially, you know, when the verbena is all flowering at the same time, like that verbena is going to be alive with bees and butterflies. Mm -hmm. um, so we want to think about that as you're planting and then plan for that for different seasons too, so that, you know, you get a, an abundance of these plants and you'll start to draw more things to your own garden. So one of, Melissa, one of the questions that somebody presented was, can you recommend pretty flowers that are deer resistant for somebody who lives in um, central New Jersey? Um, anything uh, hardy and that's perennial, but also how do you deter animals from, you um, eating those flowers so that they do last, so that, that the birds do have the seeds and the pollinators can get to them without rabbits or other animals eating them. What do you suggest for that? <clears throat> that is really <laughs> tough. Um, there is no easy answer um, because I could tell you that a plant <clears throat> is deer proof today and then tomorrow, you know, that deer could be hungry enough where it's going to come and eat that plant. So mm -hmm. I would say you have to test things um, and give things a few seasons because one of the problems is when you bring a plant home from the garden center, that has been such a heavily, um, they've given it so many nutrients and, you know, manures and so that that plant, it's like, you know, a lot of our landscape contractors say, it's like adding salt and pepper to your food, right? Like it's for that animal that eats it, it suddenly tastes amazing. Um, and so the longer it's in your garden, the less that is the case, right? So like eventually a lot of those um, chemicals or whatever have been used on that plant are starting to subside. And you might find that something that was eaten last year isn't being eaten this year. So we do see a little bit of that. Um, and then, you know, a lot of your native plants are actually going to be hardier than something that's not native. So I would say try to stick to native plants wherever you can. Um, some things are just going to be more resistant. Milkweeds are pretty good. Um, yeah, this is a great example. So grasses are always going to be a great solution. And people think, oh, well, it's not getting a flower. You know, is it really going to be benefiting birds? But what this is a great example of is the fact that those grasses at the edges are supporting a huge amount of insects. And so that's an, like part of what birds eat that we need to talk birds more about, them. you know, exactly. Right. So you talked a little bit about, you know, we should be growing fruit like our berries because birds need it out in the spring and then things that set seeds, seeds are really important in the fall but insects are so important year round. Um, and so I think there's a really great stat out there that I think a single pair of chickadees needs between like 6,000 and 9,000 caterpillars to raise one little batch of tiny birds. So, you know, it's important to have places like grasses and that'll be, that's gonna be your best bet with deer yeah. other than that. Well, I think two things that come to mind is going back to the premise of planting in mass. I think when you, 
are planting in mass, you're not going to notice it so much if a small animal comes and tries to eat it um, versus having one or two plants. At the moment they eat it, it's gone, right? So, um, and if you are planting perennials, uh, the likelihood of them coming back is, is, is very significant. They probably will regenerate and will regrow versus um, an annual type of flower. Um, but also, the other thing I want to mention too is, you know, feeding birds is very important um, to attracting them. However, when it does come time for um, late spring and summer to come along, it is very important not to overfeed your birds with seeds and bird feeders because they don't live on that alone. And they really do need to live on the natural habitat that you provide. So like you said, um, birds are really large bug eaters. And so even though you may not see them in your backyard, the birds are eating them. And one of the things that allows them really um, to be able to do that is having a layer of lower shrubs and uh, thickets that they can hop into and feel safe and pick bugs off the ground and uh, eat bugs that are crawling in. So um, creating that habitat um, and then taking away some of the food that you would normally put out say late winter to feed them as they're migrating um, gives them a chance to sort of eat what's in the natural habitat which will also help them to return to your yard every year because then they get a sense of okay there's food there for me and it's a reliable source. So I'm gonna go back to that source and it was safe. Yeah, I mean, this picture is a really great example of that, you know, creating mm -hmm. a space where, you know, you can see how open this, this area is. This is in the Hamptons. And so there are many farm fields and agricultural spaces. So having these shrub areas towards the edges of your property will help create a space where they feel secure and they can, you know, if there are predator species around, there's a place for them to hide. And then in these beds, you know, we allow some native fescue or if it's shadier, a carex or a grass to kind of serve as a natural mulch because that allows us to, you know, we can support a larger insect population. And then this area isn't being disturbed by humans as much, which mm -hmm. is really important for some of our native birds. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then this gets into like letting the edges of your property go a little more natural, you know, like you don't, you know, you're not going to be enjoying that lawn space that's right up against the fence. So allow that space to become more of a meadow. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just a great way. Any way that you can cut down on lawn, you'll increase the biodiversity in your property so much through insects. Again, that height of grass really does attract small birds in there. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. They can still see the insects. And then you're not treating it with anything. You know, you certainly do not want to use pesticides on your property when you're trying to attract um, insects and birds and wildlife in general. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, this is an easy, simple way. I mean, especially because the you'll you'll notice that your plants will be healthier for this too. So most trees do not like to have their roots driven over by machinery. So if you're not mowing under your trees you'll start to see it'll it'll certainly make a big difference and they'll be healthier. And the same is true for shrubs. Um, you know, the more that you can kind of leave them alone, the happier most of them really will be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I do have, so somebody pre presented a question, which I think is a really good and important one um, and how it relates to pesticides, um, which I'm sure you deal a lot with in educating your customers. Um, a lot of plants come with white fly on them and how can you care for your plants that will prevent them? And I would like to sort of expand upon that and say, so that it is safe for wildlife and birds. And I have found um, there's, a, I think that there's a really good range of eco-friendly, garden-friendly pesticide type products out there that you can use rather than using harsh chemicals, which will hurt birds and bees and caterpillars that become butterflies. Um, I think people need to understand that when you're using those products, it's not a, a set it and forget it thing. If you're using all natural products like that, it, from, from my experience, they need to be applied regularly. Um, and so you need to develop a plan to apply them regularly to keep your plants healthy. But also it's important not to use pesticides to keep your wildlife healthy. Yeah, I mean, those are all great points. I will say it's not that our landscapes are totally 
without any chemical interventions. You know, there are certain plants that, you know, um, especially orchards that do need some yeah, level. Sometimes you have to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's just, there's almost no way around it. And so on those properties where we have to do that, you know, we do have some that have bees and beehives. And so we deal with the beekeepers and we work with them to say, okay, let's make sure we're spraying at the right time. You know, don't spray when pollinators are at their most active. So don't spray when things are in flower, try to spray earlier in the season, you know, do everything you can to make sure that you're not going to be impeding their, you know, the natural course of, you know, whatever pollinator you're trying to attract. Mm -hmm. Then another thing I would say is that healthy soils make healthy plants. So the more you can do to make sure your, your soil is healthy, you're giving your plant, you know, everything that it needs to try to naturally fight some of those things. And mm -hmm. so um, another wonderful way to do it is to try to attract, you know, insects. Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of those things, those pests that are coming in, there's almost always a natural pest or not pest, but a natural insect that will eat that pest. So bringing in ladybugs and Katie did and mm -hmm. um, praying mantis. You know, those, those bugs will certainly help you a lot. And then you're just trying to create that healthy ecosystem. So yeah. a lot of times we end up spraying more than we have to because we've, we've somehow we've flattened that, that circle. And so you just have to try to get that rolling again. And then you'll find that you're using fewer and fewer um, sprays every year. Yeah. And I think for the average uh, backyard gardener or somebody that wants to get interested in backyard gardening, um, be mindful that you have local nurseries around your area that specialize in plant materials. So while it's convenient going to a Lowe's or a Home Depot, they don't always have the most healthy stock and they usually do have quite a bit of infestation because they don't know how to tend to the plants the way a garden center who specializes in plant material does. And usually your local garden centers will also house refrigerators that have um, uh, praying mantis and that have ladybugs. So if you're unsure how to create a colony of them, ask at your local garden centers if they carry any of them and you can bring them home and you can insert their packaging into your bush and they will naturally just migrate out or if it's a praying mantis, the, the pod will eventually hatch the, uh, the insect. And um, so you can actually buy these things to put in your yard to help that ecosystem get going. Um, so some, for, for those people who would say, oh, I don't see any of those things in my yard, how do I get them? Um, I think that's probably the easiest way for the backyard uh, yeah. gardener to do that. Um, yeah. And that's another way. And I also think um, if you are using chemicals and even eco-friendly chemicals, spray them at times when birds and bees and uh, butterflies are not active. So you don't want those um, animals or insects to be coming into contact with wet liquid. That's the dangerous part of it. And you don't want to necessarily spray the pollen or the nectar of the flowers. So if you are spraying, do it in the evening when activity is low and let it dry and try not to hit the flower portion of the plant. So hit uh, the stems and the um, leaves of it and sometimes the ground around it and that will greatly help as well. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad you mentioned you know, going to your local garden center because that's like by far the best thing you can do. Like if you're wondering where to start, just visiting a, a garden center like that's great because they're going to be able to guide you in what native plants you should be speci you know, specifying for your garden. And, and if you're not sure where a local garden center is, I know that the Audubon actually has a really great native plants database. And so you can search for your region and then they have a local resources tab. And if you click on that, it'll give you all of the um, garden centers in your area that sell native plants. And it can also populate a list for you. So if you're, you know, you don't know even what kind of plant you're looking for, it'll give you a list of all of the native plants in your area that do well. And then it'll, it'll also it'll give you an idea of what birds will visit each one of those plants. So it can help you kind of narrow down what you want to add and then send you in the right place to find them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, let me ask you, because somebody's asking, what do you recommend to plant around or under evergreens where lower branches are shedding needles? 
due to the age uh, and shade from years of growth, um, you know, they, they question ferns or something else. And I, I think for me, from a backyard perspective, I probably would not underplant it because um, I think one of the things that you have to consider when attracting birds is also giving them a source of material for building their nests. And pine needles are a fantastic material um, for birds to pick up and weave into their nests. So sometimes leaving the ground bare like that, if there is a heavy coverage of branch, um, leave it and see what the birds do under there. And if they're very active, don't touch it, don't plant under it. Um, of course, ferns are great to plant in the shade. Um, and you could also plant just a very low uh, ground cover that is shade tolerant as well. But do you, what do you think for that, Melissa? Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. I, you know, about the pine needles, that's one of the things that it can hurt birds a lot. And I should have touched on with the birdhouse is that you want to leave nesting material because if you don't have anything on your property and they can't create a soft nest within those boxes, then they're not going to hang around. So pine needles is a big one. You know, they do use them a lot. Um, and so the more of that you can leave in your beds, you know, along with leaves and grasses, the more likely you are to have nesting birds. And I would say the same thing, you know, if you don't need to plant it, don't plant it because you don't want to disturb tree roots if you don't have to. Um, but if you are looking to do, get something underneath there, you, you'll want something that can take the acid. So your soil pH is going to be a little different under those trees. Um, and so something like a blueberry actually does really well there. And so that could be in a good way to attract more birds because they're going to eat the blueberries and then create a lower um, area of shelter for them. So. Oh, that's fantastic. I actually did not know that uh, blueberries would do that. Yeah. So I love that. And so another question that came in, and I think this is a good segue because I want to talk about something that you're involved in that you actually educated me about, um, which is the pollinator pathway program. And somebody um, asked about um, how do you handle attracting birds uh, no, that wasn't the question. Um, how do you how do you provide instructions for creating a bee house to promote the presence of bees for pollination? And um, you're involved with the pollinator pathway program. We actually don't have it down here in Florida yet, but tell us what that is and why it's important. Sure. So it's I don't think the program has been around that long. I want to say it's <clears throat> only three years old, um, but we're very lucky here in the Northeast. We're between Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey. We have a pretty great program of local municipalities who are joining the pollinator pathway. And so what that is, is we're trying to establish pollinator friendly habitats and create food sources for all of our pollinating insects and wildlife. And so the idea behind it is that you know, no pollinator garden can be an island. Like you need to be able to attract pollinators to it. And pollinators tend to follow food sources. So if you have no, you know, butterfly gardens near you, then you can plant out the most beautiful butterfly garden space and they're never going to find their way to you. So what we're trying to do is to take areas that are currently not being used for much, like median plantings or, you know, large open space in some of our like smaller municipal parks and we're trying to plant um, meadows and butterfly gardens and create spaces for these bees and butterflies and insects to go as they're traveling throughout our region. And so the whole point of the program is trying to connect state by state for migratory reasons and for sources for bees to be able to do that, correct? Yeah, I mean, I think everybody knows that our butterfly population has dropped dramatically over, you know, the X number of years. And so it, since they've been doing a lot of research about that, you know, one of the things that's come out of it is just the lack of habitat and spaces for these birds and butterflies and bees. And so, you know, the more we create just acres and acres of lawn, the fewer places we have for these insects and wildlife to go. And so what we're trying to do is to take back even small portions of these properties to give pollinators a space to go. And so we all know the benefits of pollinators, right? Like, you know, I think 90% of our food crops, we wouldn't have them without pollinators. So mm -hmm. it's really important that we 
take back some of the land for these insects and pollinators. And, you know, all it means is giving up a, a little bit of our lawn to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that, you know, I know for me down here in Florida, um, we get the fritillary um, butterfly and they eat passion flower vine. And of course, it's the most beautiful vine in the world. But um, I have learned to plant enough of it in my yard, but also plant it in hidden areas. So behind my studio in the garden, nobody sees. So I have a whole wall of that vine growing that I just let the caterpillars chomp down to nothing. And come summer, I have 100 to 200 orange butterflies flying around in my yard. Um, and then they also, and same thing with the milkweed, I've, I've planted some of that and I've got a lot of monarchs that are here and then they lay their eggs and they, they continue to come back year after year. Um, and I think it would be a great opportunity for us to do another one of these with um, all of the participants to talk about um, setting up a bee colony and to go further into depth with the pollinator program and how a backyard garden can actually establish just one hive um, that could make great changes uh, throughout the country. And if, you know, we can't, I, I, I always have believed we can't control um, the totality of our complete ecosystem, but we can control the one that's in our backyard. And by doing a little bit on our own, uh, if everybody did that, imagine the total amount that we would be able to affect. Right. And this goes back to talking about, you know, how people are using their properties more and more, and they're starting to see that ecosystem. And, you know, one of the amazing things last summer was being able to show my my son is three, and so he's very into bugs. And so being able to show him, we had some milkweed that sort of, you know, had caterpillars on it. And I was so excited at the ability to show him like the entire life cycle of it getting to a butterfly, but the birds came and ate them instead. So we just got to have a different type of conversation about yeah. what, you know, what that means. Yeah. But that it just shows you how the, this is all, everything is connected, right? Like, and the more you're in your landscape and the more you're seeing this, the more you realize how you're affecting it and your choices. So, you know, when you have a lawn area and I am guilty of having a lawn area because I do have that toddler and I have dogs. Yeah, but that makes sense. You know, yeah, I, and I just have to balance it with what else I'm doing. And so mm -hmm. I make sure that I do provide enough habitat for other insects and butterflies and bees. And it gets to be a learning experience for my son and my vegetable garden is much healthier because of it. Yeah, totally. Well, so I wanna wrap up. Um, I think we've answered uh, most all of the questions and if any more come in, you guys, please um, send me a message on uh, Instagram and I will be happy to continue to answer any of those questions or if you need any suggestions with creating a backyard garden or if you have a, a question specifically for Melissa, um, message me on Instagram or email me and I will be happy to reply to those and help any way that I can. Um, I do wanna thank you, Melissa, for joining us. This has been fantastic. And I would like to um, continue the conversation in a few weeks and uh, talk about bees and planning for that. And um, you guys, you can please go to my Instagram page at Home with Joseph and follow me. And also um, don't forget to go to YouTube at Home with Joseph. All the videos are up there as well as on Aspire site. Please go to Hollander Design and check out some of their work. Um, I've been on their site and it's absolutely stunning. Um, and uh, thank you for joining us. We will see you in a couple of weeks. Melissa, thank you. It's been a pleasure. And uh, I look forward to continuing the conversation. Me too. I'm so excited about it. Thank you. Thank for you. I appreciate it.